So I just happened to say to John Rudy one day, you know, that I had actually worked on a project to design Space Colony. And then when I looked at the schedule, I found I was scheduled for Rock about it today. So. <laughs> this is how one goes forward. Now, I call it designing a space settlement. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of the background. Uh, it is actually a fairly big deal, what we did, I thought at the time. Uh, and it resulted in this uh, uh, structure, which is shown here on, uh, let's see if I can do this here. Get my pointer over here. I can use my finger, I suppose. But uh, here, this is the structure I'm going to talk about. It actually has a name. It's called the Stanford Taurus. A torus is, you know, is a donut. This is essentially a bicycle wheel. And the idea is that it's going to be rotating in space to produce a pseudo gravity, and that people are living inside the inner tube of the bicycle wheel. And they're walking around with their feet pointing out to you on this picture. And their heads pointing towards the hub, which is what will happen if you produce your pseudo-gravity by rotating that thing. All right, so that's, that's the idea. And I want to tell you a little bit of how we got there. Now, another name for this. Would you equally with the head? The head and the feet could maybe reverse? So if you're standing on your head. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, if you were just upright, and it started spinning. Well, you think, give me a minute, John. <laughs> I'll show you a picture. Go to an amusement park. You know, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I just want you to know, though, that there's another name for this uh, talk uh, that I thought uh, took me back to my school days, which is uh, designing a space settlement, or what I did on my summer vacation. Because this was a, a project uh, sponsored by NASA. NASA uh, had uh, a program of summer internships in which they brought together a group of engineers, mostly, uh, and occasional other scientists, to work on a project of some uh, that would be picked for each summer. So for example, the pre summer preceding, it was on fire control in the forests of the country. And they had a group of engineers and people sit down and spend 10 weeks planning a system of what you have to do to control that. Ours was to design a space settlement for 10,000 people in space. And the idea uh, came from uh, a Princeton professor named uh, Gerard K. O'Neill. Jerry O'Neill, uh, a man of considerable distinction, had, uh, had some of the original ideas for storage rings in accelerator physics. Uh, if you don't know what they are, don't worry about it but it was a big advance in accelerator physics when he had the idea. But in the early 70s, he worked with a group of, he, he was teaching Princeton undergraduates, he's a Princeton professor, and they got at this idea of uh, how big a structure could you make in space for people to live in? And his idea was really, really big. And they went through the strength of materials and they did a lot of investigation to see if the engineering parameters would work. And so he was talking about two counter-spinning cylinders. If you counter-spin them, then you can conserve your angular momentum, keep it zero total. And they're going to be four miles in diameter, and they're going to be 16 miles long. And, uh, and he's talking about cities that he thought might hold a million people. So that was kind of the vision. And in 1974, he published in Physics Today, a magazine known to all physicists, uh, it's kind of a house organ of the physics profession. He published uh, an article with the details of his, what he and his students had worked out over the preceding several years. Uh, and it was an idea uh, that uh, was very attractive. I, I read the article and I thought, oh, gee, this is really cool stuff. And then uh, that following summer, for summer of 75, NASA announced that their internship program for systems design was going to be to design a space colony and to have some conception of what the overall system would be. You know, who's, who's going to go? What's it, where's it going to be? Uh, how are you going to supply it? How is it going to be self-sustaining? What's it going to do for money? Is it going to be commercially successful? And so these were all ideas that O'Neill had already thought about. But this sort of uh, prospect of doing this uh, was uh, 
to me, very exciting. Um, the idea is this is the kind of the system that he had in mind. Uh, and this tells you kind of the parameters of the system. You're, you're, you're going to go into space. You're going to uh, have to get up off of Earth into low Earth orbit. So there's your, there's one definition. The question is, what is low Earth orbit? Uh, I'll tell you that in a minute. Uh, you're going to want to use geosynchronous orbit, which is another uh, t term, which I'll elaborate a little bit more. And many of you are familiar with it already. And you're going to have to go to the moon. And because uh, the gravitational attraction of the moon is only one-sixth that of the Earth, it's way more easy to get ores and sort of basic uh, rocks off the moon than off the Earth. So the system would, would call for you to launch material from the moon, catch it, and then ferry it over to a colony where there's going to be refining of the ores and there's going to be construction of uh, solar power power stations, solar energy power stations in space that will collect the solar energy, convert it to microwaves, beam it down to the surface of the Earth, and sell it to you for 20 cents a kilowatt hour or whatever the going rate would be. And that would be the fundamental commercial justification for having a space colony there. There are lots of problems, okay, about, about this. Uh, one is that uh, electricity is actually a lot cheaper than 20 cents a kilowatt hour, except in New York City. Uh, and, uh, but that's, that's kind of the overall plan. Uh, the elements of it were already present in what O'Neill did, so O'Neill is really the major conceiver of this. But, but NASA had a slightly different vision of what the summer study should be. Uh, it should be a, uh, a bring together a group of people of many different disciplines. So there were uh, 20 of us who were interns, and there were 10 engineers. And there was a civil engineer, there was a mechanical engineer, electrical, chemical, industrial. We had, a, we had sort of a spectrum of the engineering professions. Uh, we had six physicists, including O'Neill. We had two sociologists. We had one architect and one economist. I mean, these are things, if you're going to live in space, you really need to talk to people about how to make it attractive enough to happen. We also had five MIT students from aeronautics and astronautics. Uh, and they were there largely uh, as a coterie of mentees of O'Neill. O'Neill had uh, done a semester of visiting professor at MIT, and he had this group of students who were uh, sort of uh, very much uh, energized by this idea of building a habitat in space, a large one. There was also a Harvard student of economics, again, sort of part of the O'Neill uh, group of students. There were two directors. Uh, one was kind of your NASA director, uh, who was a reasonable guy, and, and Bill Verplank was engineering design at Stanford University with a vigorous interest in engineering education. Anyway, they were the guys to whom we were beholden. But, I mean, <laughs> Johnson controlled the money, so we, uh, but, but both of them uh, were kind of under the framework of the internship, which said that our group was to be self-organizing. We, we didn't have a director. We were not responsible to a boss. Instead, we were supposed to uh, find among ourselves people to manage. And so we had overall group managers for three weeks at a time. And then uh, uh, we also had uh, subgroup managers. When we had a topic, we would uh, assign among ourselves the you know, if you're going to talk about how you're going to get the, how much heat are you going to generate in the, uh, in the habitat, and how are you going to get it out when you have too much in there. We have engineers who think about these things, and these are not things that physicists think about in uh, much detail. Uh, and so we would say, okay, you three guys go sit over there and think about this for a while and uh, come back with a, with a plan for how we're going to get the heat out and how much it's going to be. And so that kind of thing was, was done by ourselves. The self-organization turned out to have a very surprising effect on the summer, and I'll come back to that in, in a little bit. But, but before I go on much more talking about the habitat, 
uh, and the design, I, I need to do just a little review of kind of a basic uh, aspect of physics. And that, that aspect is uh, uniform circular motion. Now John was asking which way do your feet point when you're being spun. So here we can go to an amusement park and they put you on the carousel and they're spinning you. And you can see which way the feet are pointing. They're right there. They're pointing, they're pointing out. They're pointing out which would be the hub of the torso. Wouldn't this be your center of mass that is pushed to the outside? Well, you go with your center of mass. I know, but why would the feet go as opposed to well, so if your back? If you fell down and being shiny. Yeah, but what happens on the earth? You seem to be all right with your feet pointing down on the earth. Yeah, I don't know why. Why they point down on the earth? Well, we maybe have to discuss this. It's anthropology. Anyway, well, I, I do. I mean, this is a classic, classic question in the introductory physics course: is what happens if you cut the wires on one of these things? Which way does he go? So that's the difference between gravity and centrifugal force. Gravity is going to pull you towards it, and centrifugal is going to spin you out. Down. Centrifugal force is a fictitious force, so you're going to have your angular momentum, which is going to carry you out a little bit to the side. See? Okay. No, but here it is. Here it is again, a little bit more clearly. Ball on the end of the string, and you're whipping the thing around the string. And, and what I'm interested in here is this kind of motion where you go with a constant speed <laughs> around a circle of radius r. That's that's uniform circular motion. That's the trade term. Uh, and if you cut the string, what happens? And some of you gave the answer that most undergraduates would give. You said it would go out. And no, it won't go out. It goes, as somebody else said, tangentially. As Goliath learned. <laughs> well, as David learned. <laughs> Yeah. David, David already knew it. Was, well, David, okay. <laughs> it was more important, yeah. Are we in flat land or? We are, we are orbiting oh. in space. Oh, okay. You, you came in after the interaction. Right. <laughs> All right. So, so the question is, what does it take to make something go in a circle? And the answer uh, was first given correctly by, of all people, Isaac Newton. And... The answer is, it requires an acceleration directed at the center of the circle. So the way you make something go around a circle is to always have that acceleration pointing at the center of the circle. And furthermore, it has to relate to the velocity and the radius by this rather simple expression. The acceleration has to be the square of the speed divided by the radius of the circle. Newton actually coins the word centripetal. That word did not exist until he created it. Uh, and in a way, it's a put down of the word centrifugal because there is no centrifugal force, as Bob was just pointing out. Uh, we think there is because we're very parochial in our views. And if somebody puts us in a rotating system, we think we're about to be thrown out. Although, in fact, what you find out is you go tangentially if something happens. So Newton coins the world. So this is centripetal acceleration square of the speed divided by the radius of the circle. Now, it has enormous consequences for travel in space, uh, and, and also, as you'll see in a bit, for the design of your rotating habitat. And so, here's some of the consequences. One of the things about it is that it's often desirable to talk about not the speed that you're traveling, but the time it takes to go once around the circle. So that capital T there is supposed to be the period, the time to go once around. Uh, and, uh, and so then, fairly obviously, I'd like to think, that the speed V is going to be equal to the distance around the circle, which is 2 pi r, the circumference of a circle, divided by the time it takes to go once around. It's almost a uh, tautology here, but, but that's important because uh, I want to... Uh, connect that through the centripetal acceleration to a different form for the centripetal acceleration. I'm just replacing V by the 2 pi r over t. I have to square that. One of the r's cancel. And what I have is the centripetal acceleration is related to the radius of curvature and the period of rotation. And so that's what I like. Once you've got that, you've got a lot of kind of nifty things to know. For one thing, 
low Earth orbit uh, has an acceleration, which is basically the acceleration we experience on the surface of the Earth, g, 9.8 meters per second, 32 feet per second, uh, 9.8 meters per second squared, 32 feet per second squared. The radius is the radius of the Earth, which person knows. Uh, and, uh, and so you put that in to the formula for the period, I just solved that, and lo and behold, the period's 84 minutes. So if you want that cannonball that Newton was firing off the top of the mountain, it's going to take 84 minutes to go around. And uh, uh, that's not a good place for a satellite orbit. Uh, you know, you sort of it'll hit the trees and the bushes if you're trying to do it mm -hmm. at, at the surface of the Earth. It's better to go up higher. And if you go up a little higher, you'll find most low Earth orbits are running around 90 minutes. That's the period of uh, a low Earth orbit. You can also uh, say to yourself, uh, can I find an orbit where the rotation period of the thing that's orbiting is equal to the rotation period of the planet? So now I want to I wanna know where do I go to have the period be one day? Well, uh, same thing. I say, oh, except it's a little different now because I'm going off the surface of the Earth, and this may be a little confusing, but uh, I'm going to go in Earth radii. I'm going to go out in Earth radii from the center of the Earth. So when I get out there, g, the acceleration of gravity, will be actually reduced by n squared. Inverse square law, if you, if you go two radii, if, if you go one radii up from the surface of the Earth, the acceleration of gravity is one-fourth g over 2 squared. You go up 2 more radii, then the distance from the center of Earth is 3 Earth radii. g is now 9, one ninth of what it was. Mm -hmm. So you can just set that up in the equation, solve for the equation, and you find, oh yeah, there's a place. 6.63 Earth radii out from the center of the Earth, something in orbit is going around 24 hours, just the same speed that the Earth rotates on its axis. If you want to know how far that is above the surface of the Earth, Subtract one Earth radius. And so what you find is GEO, geosynchronous Earth orbit, is 5.63 Earth radii above the surface. That's about 22,200 miles. It's about 35,000 kilometers. And that's valuable real estate in the satellite business because it means you don't have to, uh, it saves you a lot of problems. All right. <laughs> now, that's, that's a couple things. Uh, one of the one related to this, and I'll show you in a minute how it's related, is the fact that there are hills and valleys in the gravitational structure of space, <coughs> and these turn out to be uh, useful and important in several ways. Uh, so these hills and valleys were discovered first by Lagrange, a mathematician, and <laughs> these there are five points. If you have two substantially large bodies, say the Earth and the Moon, and a smaller body whose mass is negligible compared to the Earth and the Moon, <laughs> there will be five places where the uniform circular motion of this light body will be equal to the orbiting period of the two bodies, Moon and Earth, about their common center of mass. So that's an important idea if you've got that. You got a thing. So the whole system, Earth Moon system, is going this way, and there are these five points which go with it. So that if you're at one of those points, you stay in a kind of fixed relationship to both the Earth and the Moon. This is true for any two large masses. So there are five Lagrangian points for the Earth Moon system. There are also five Lagrangian points for the Earth Sun system. There are five Lagrangian points for the Earth. Jupiter, uh, for the Sun-Jupiter system. The fact that there are all these other things around actually mess up the exactness of these, the existence of these points. But still, they're very handy because you can park something in one of these points. And because the, what I said is not exactly true, you have to do some station keeping. You're going to have to expend some fuel to stay there, but you don't have to expend much. And so they become really desirable locations for various satellite uh, positioning. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. But, but here, uh, uh, I'm, I'm interested in this for a couple of reasons, but the main reason is uh, 
L1, L2, and L3, these are known as unstable equilibrium points. There is, in fact, a saddle-shaped gravitational uh, well there, so that it holds you in position in one direction, but in the other direction, if you go a little bit off, it pulls you away. And that's what an instability means. But there are two, L4 and L5, that are bowl-shaped gravity wells, shallow wells. So if you're in there, you will pretty much stay there. Even the unstable ones turn out to be useful. But the point I want to make here is there is this kind of topography. And so you can make a topographic map of it. Uh, you have a heavy mass, you have another mass, maybe not so heavy, it doesn't make a difference, but you can think of M1 as being the Earth and M2 as being the uh, moon, and then there's your L1, L2, L3, L5, L4, and you can see these things. <laughs> An important message here, it's something which we think about in connection with living in space, is that we live in a very deep hole. This gravitational well is a long way down and it costs a lot to get out of it. That's why space is expensive. The moon is in another hole, not nearly so deep, but still it's another hole. And so when you talk about living on the moon, you're going to have to pay to get off the Earth, and you're going to have to pay to get down on and back out of the moon hole. Not, not nearly so bad. Whereas if you're at a place like L5, and you want to get somewhere else in space, you really don't have to do very much. And I'll, I'll show you that in another way. But before that, I thought you'd probably like to see uh, like some surprisingly useful features of L1 and L2. <coughs> um, L1, you see, if this is the sun and the earth, then they're all going to move around together. So L1 is always going to be looking at the sun. It's great. There's not going to be any eclipses of whatever's at L1 by the Earth. We have right now a satellite out there that's put there to study the Sun. That's why it's put there. It's supposed to look at the Sun and not have the Earth get in the way all the time of looking at the Sun. <clears throat> L2 is, is in use right now. You know recently the Chinese landed a, a rover on the far side of the Moon. There's no radio communication from the far side of the moon. You can't get your data back. But the Chinese have also put a transmitter station at L2. Because L2 is out there, and now you've got enough angle. You can, you can beam up from the far side of the moon to L2, and it's going to sit in fixed relationship to the far side of the moon as you go around. So uh, you can uh, use that as a relay station, and that's in fact what they do. The data that come back from the Chinese satellite comes up off the moon to L2 uh, and then makes its way back to the Earth. In fact, L2 is not, or the, the satellite is not at a point in L2. It's in an orbit around that point, so it's going to be out so it can see the Earth. You can see, you can see you, Harry. You can look around the moon. Right. Yep. Well, in fact, uh, no, it doesn't go around the moon. That's what's kind of interesting. It does this. It goes out there, and it goes around L2, while the moon, uh, this is a different, it does this around the lunar uh, Earth L2. This one is actually in use for uh, the Earth and the Sun. Uh, there was something called the Wilson, uh, the W map. It's a satellite set up to measure the very tiny fluctuations in the cosmic microwave back, background. That's been up there, it's been a big success. It's why we think we know a whole lot about the universe that we didn't know a decade ago. And WMAP is put at L2 of the Earth-Sun system because then the Earth shadows the WMAP from the Sun so the WMAP can be looking at the cosmic microwave background without the radiations and the various radio emissions of the sun messing up what it sees. And so it's very useful. These orbits around these points are called halo orbits. It's just a wonderful amount of clever engineering, really, of orbital uh, structures that we use in lots of different ways. Uh, I find it fascinating. 
does it take much fuel to stabilize the... Uh... It does take some fuel. Mm -hmm. It takes less fuel than almost anything else you would do. Uh, but eventually it runs out of fuel, and then you're done with your mission. But you go there because it takes the least amount of fuel to sustain your mission. <coughs> so, th and another way of summarizing this, and this is a map that we, we've, it's a little hard for you to read, and I'll tell you what the story is. Uh, this is a map of delta V, sort of the change in velocity that you're going to have to achieve with a rocket to get from one place to another. And it's a certain amount of fiction here, but you see, down here is the Earth's surface. Here's low Earth orbit. It takes 8,600 meters per second is what this says. What that means is it takes a hell of a lot of energy and momentum, really, to get off the Earth and get up to low Earth orbit. That's the deep hole that I was talking about. That's why, we're, that's why it's hard to get out. Once you're in low Earth orbit, if you want to go on to the moon, it takes you, well, if you want to go to the lunar orbit, it, it takes you only half as much. See, Heinlein once said somewhere, once you're in Earth orbit, you're halfway to almost anywhere. And that's true. Uh, for example, uh, if we want to go out to L5, it takes, again, half as much to go from low Earth orbit up to L5. Once you're in L5, if you want to go to lunar orbit, it takes hardly anything at all, 700 meters per second. That's a little bit going that way. If you want to go to geosynchronous orbit or come from geosynchronous orbit, 1,700 meters per second, not so much. The, the point is that it's, it's, once you're up in space, it's rather easy, it's cheap, to go from one place to another in space. Just stay out of those holes. Don't, don't go down the gravity wells. That's kind, of the, that's kind of the message. All right, then, the reason I did this, a little digression, but uh, the reason I did this was because this uniform circular motion thing has a huge impact on the design of the space habitat that we're looking for. And why is that? How is that? Well, it's like this. We, sitting around tables at uh, uh, Moffett Field, where the Ames Research Laboratory is in California, said, uh, we listened to, we had experts come in, we had some space uh, doctors come in, they're guys who had been measuring astronauts and finding out how much bone density changed when they spent time in space. It's, it was all bad, it was all irreversible. I mean, you could do stuff to, to slow it down, but it turned out that everybody who spends time in space comes back with a lower bone density. And, uh, and you say, all right, we're gonna go and live there forever? You know, are you gonna turn into jellyfish? Uh, what's gonna happen? So we said, and it was kind of conservative, we said, we're gonna have pseudo gravity, it's gonna have to be 1G. We're gonna do Earth. Uh, as somebody whose knees hurt much of the time, I, I think this is a bad decision. I would, I would happily go for a half G, but you know, uh, maybe, maybe the next assisted livings will be uh, in space. Uh, now, so that's, that's one decision. Once you make one G, uh, then you're going to go to your expression for centripetal acceleration, and you're gonna put G in for the centripetal acceleration. Now the next decision has a huge impact. You're gonna to say to yourself, uh, I don't want to spin faster than one revolution per minute. Now this, again, was something that the doctors said to us, you know, they said something like 2% of the population will get inner ear disturbances or be space sick or something if you go faster than one RPM. You go around more faster than one RPM. And so we said, all right, this is for the general people, the populace we'll go with one RPM. So now our period of rotation is 60 seconds. One RPM is 60 seconds. That now says, all right, I gotta have something whose radius is such that the centripetal acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared, and the period is 60 seconds, or the square is 3,600 seconds, divided by four pi squared, and you just do the numbers. You have to have a structure that's 895 meters in radius. You're talking about something almost 1.8 kilometers across. You're talking about something that's over a mile in diameter. And you're stuck with it. That's, once you decide you want 1G and you want 1 RPM, it's, you gotta, you gotta be swinging on this radius. Now there are a lot of ways you can do that. It isn't unique. So 
one of the ways you can do it is you can put people into little balls at the end of a, a rod, a dumbbell, and spin the dumbbell around its center axis, make the dumbbell one point or 1,800 meters across. If you want to have more people there, well, you can use a lot of dumbbells and put them up in a stack or something like that. Or you can put them in a kind of stack like this, uh, multiple beads in a ring. You could just put them in a torus. You could put them in a sphere. But once you put them in a sphere, you've got a huge volume that's going to have to be filled with your atmosphere. You're carrying a tremendous overhead. That's true also for a cylinder. If you make a cylinder big enough, uh, again, you've got a huge volume. You might want to stack your torus, toroids if you want. You could make them beaded. We went with the torus because, again, we were talking, we, we would kind of persuade ourselves of things which were later on you think about it and say, gee, well, it's not really such a good idea. But, uh, but uh, we said, look, it's supposed to be pleasant living in space, so you'd like to have people with some kind of long sight lines. And if you start putting them in little beads, they don't have a like, long sight line. They're going to feel like they're living in a little bead. Uh, or, you know. And so that's why we went with the Taurus. The Taurus was a kind of mm, living quality of life decision. I'll bet if anybody builds one of these things for practical commercial purposes, they will be a lot less concerned for quality of life. You know, it's much more like a mining camp or, uh, you know, or, or a prison. But, or an airliner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Talk about fun. Well, all right. So, so you, you, you now have a torus. It has to be 895 meters in radius. 1,800 meters across. Well, what about the cross-section of the tube? How big should that be? <laughs> and now, that's, a, that's another quality of life decision. And you're, you're making it because you say to yourself, well, uh, we, we talked about it in terms of area per person. And we had in our minds, uh, partly thanks to Jerry O'Neill, but we had in our minds some uh, examples. Somerville, Massachusetts, this was not on our list. I thought we should adapt to local interests. Somerville, Massachusetts is the most densely po populated municipality in Massachusetts, which I didn't know until about three days ago. And uh, it has about 80,000 people living in 11 square kilometers. And that comes out to 138 square meters per person. Manhattan, on the other hand, has 1,630,000 people living in almost 60 square kilometers. That comes out to about 36 square meters per person. So we were thinking about things like this. That's because uh, Manhattan has a lot of business places that don't have people living in it. Um, that take up a lot of its real estate. I think when... Central Park, too. No, 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 I don't think that works. Uh, that's a question of how many people come into Manhattan in a day. Yeah, I think the... Yeah. The popular, this, this is supposed to be the number of people living in Manhattan. That's correct, but the people who live in Manhattan probably only use 10 or 15 percent of the space. Ah, fair enough. That, will, and they, that gives a legitimate criticism against the picture that I'll show you in a moment. Anyway, we decided that for L5, as the colony became known because of where it was going to be placed, we should have 10,000 people and we should allocate 67 square meters per person. Now that's not very much. Uh, it's not as bad as it sounds because after all, we're going to be in the tube uh, and so uh, we're talking here about sort of how much area there is in the diametral plane that goes around that tube. So there would be 65 uh, and the answer is, and I see I never wrote the answer down anywhere, the answer is if you want to give 67 square meters of Sp flat space in that diametral plane of the inner tube, uh, it has to be uh, 130 meters in diameter. So a couple of football fields is what that, that is. Or it isn't quite a couple of football fields. <laughs> and it's not as bad as you think because you can deck it. There's nothing it says you only have to have one 
one floor, we use the one the floor in the middle, but you can have floors below it, and you can also have terracing, you can, you can build things up the walls. And so, so it isn't as bad as 67 square meters. I actually, my wife and I actually live in 67 square meters. We have a little con, well, we live with our daughter and we fixed up the downstairs and we have 650 square feet, which is about 67 square meters. Uh, and if that's all the space there was going to be in my life, I would be very unhappy. <laughs> all right, and, and here, just to make the point, uh, John was saying there's a lot of this space in Manhattan. This is what Manhattan looks like. This is, uh, uh, a lot of that space is not used uh, by the people who live there. It's used by people who come in to work there during the day and go home at night. But here's what Somerville looks like. I just took a Google satellite segment out of Somerville. It's pretty dense. They got some trees. It looks, it's okay. It's uh, all uh, low-level stuff. Uh, in fact, uh, Jerry O'Neill, uh, in testifying before Congress, as he had to do this summer, we were all working together, he had to go back to Congress and talk about uh, space colonies to some congressional committee. He always liked to talk about perched villages in southern France, which have uh, densities uh, he said to us of populations that kind of like what we're talking about in the space colony. It looks pretty nice, you know. Uh, we were not above we were not above having it look pretty nice, whether the reality was such. Anyway, the the result of all this uh, uh, these these design decisions was the Stanford Taurus. And uh, and now there are several problems that I'm I'm only gonna uh, talk a little bit about. But uh, one problem, quite quite big problem, is how do you get sunlight into this thing? Remember, it's a bicycle wheel. People's feet, John, are pushing against this wall if they're standing up. They're pushing against the outer tire. Uh, and their heads are pointing in towards the hub. So how do you get light in? And the design calls to put overhead a large mirror. So this sort of up above, you can see is a mirror, has a big hole in the middle, but uh, uh, because you need to be able to get rockets to come in, uh, you need to have space transport to come in. Because one of the advantages of the rotating torus is that at the hub, the rotation speed is very small. It, actually, at zero at the exact center. So that's the ideal place to dock if you're coming in from uh, space with materials and people or whatever. And so you would come into the docking facility at the center and then you'd go out through the spokes. The spokes are really elevators because you are going down to deeper gravity. And then the pseudo-gravity at the center is also zero. And then as you move out along the spokes, the pseudo-gravity will increase. And as you get to the outside, uh, it will be 1G because we're designing it to be 1G. Is precession of the torus a problem? Precession? It's rotating, yeah, it, it's rotating in a rotating system. Um, it's a good question, and I don't know the answer, actually. Um, it, it's not the worst problem. I'll show you some <laughs> of the worst problems. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, so, uh, so the idea is that you have this mirror up there, uh, light comes down, and uh, these are more mirrors. And so you, you go into what's essentially a skylight. The inner side of the ring is uh, transparent to, to light. Now that, uh, uh, and I might as well, while we're here, uh, point out, you see this long uh, thing going down. If you could see over here, uh, here's another space colony. So this is clearly a picture that's late in development. There are already multiple colonies. <laughs> and, uh, and so the goes down here. This is a uh, this is where you do your refining. This is your industrial area down here because you don't want it close to where people are. Living. It also uh, oh yeah. There's also something here that you can't quite make out. I don't think it's even shown on this picture. But you got to get the heat out of this thing. You're bringing light in. So we're trying to do the engineering correctly. Yeah. Is the mirror spinning too? The mirror is. The mirror is actually built into the part of the inner tube. How do you couple the light into the torus? 
Watch, nothing up this sleeve. Nothing up that sleeve. But let, let me tell you that the, an, an aspect of the problem of coupling light into the torus is the question that you ask if you're going to be out in space is, what about ionizing radiation? There's a lot of it. We on Earth live uh, with two benefits that we don't think about much. One is we have a magnetic field that is strong enough to shunt away the lower energy parts of the uh, uh, incoming ionizing radiation, the cosmic rays and stuff like that. It doesn't get it all because there's higher energy stuff, but not so much of it. And uh, the, we have also an atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere is equivalent in mass to 10 meters of water. In other words, if you go swimming and you go down 10 meters, your pressure will be two atmospheres, the one that's on top of the water and now the water. So, so our atmosphere is equivalent to 10 meters thickness of, of, of matter. And that's all you want to stop ionizing radiation is stuff. You don't care. You know, we would use lead because it's, you, you only need uh, what would be 10 meters divided by 9, I guess. So you only need a meter of lead to be equivalent to the atmosphere or something like that. Uh, and, uh, and so you, not only do you have to worry about how you get the light in, you have to worry about how you get the light in without letting in any ionizing radiation. And so here's, uh, here's a design solution. You're going to make your mirror out of uh, doubly silvered chevrons. These are glass chevrons. They're, they're aluminum coated on both sides so that light comes in, bounces, 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 and into the torus. And ionizing radiation gets stopped by the mass of the glass. That's, that was the design idea. It's a nice idea. Um, Does that put a fair amount of energy into that mass? You mean how much heat losses are going to be in the mirror themselves? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. Not from the cosmic rays. They're not a big source of energy. And you're, the, the solar energy is the big energy, and you're driving that into the interior. Um, it does, uh, does raise the question oops, sorry. does raise the question of heat loads. This is just to show kind of engineering thoughtfulness at work. Um, you get, uh, you get, you're going to need 66 megawatts of energy uh, supplied to your plants because you're going to have to have agriculture if you want this thing to be self-sustaining. In the living areas, you need 35 megawatts for illumination. Uh, you're going to need electricity of 30 megawatts to run things. Uh, you're going to put it all together, and eventually you're going to want 131 megawatts radiated back out into space. And for that, you're going to have a great big radiator panel that sticks down from the side. It does not rotate. It just conducts the heat away. And, uh, does that ignore the fact that space will be cooling just by being... Um, is that a cool? I mean, if you're, if you're well, it space, means the only way you can get rid of your heat is by radiation. No, I understand that. No. The space is cold, right? Yeah. So space would be cooling off this, even if you didn't have an intentional radiator. There would be some radiation coming out of the structure itself, right. but that's not enough. The mm -hmm. question then is, how good a conductor is a vacuum compared with materials? And well, it's really not that good. No, that's why you're doing radiation. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is no, there's no loss of heat no by conduction or convection, because there's nothing there to do conduction or convection. It's all got to come out of radiation. You know, you're radiating. I mean, we all radiate as well as have our heat taken away by evaporation. John, coolness is not a, coolness is not a property. That's relevant. It's, a, it's the actual radiation thing. The heat content of the radiation. Yeah. So you're just assuming that it's being dumped and it may not, it may be not going in. I don't know if you assumed it was a perfect black body radiating. No, well. Yeah, something. We multiply it by 0.7 or right. something. Yeah. Right. 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 So, so anyway, here's the structure uh, main mirror, hub, toroid. 
radiator, big radiator off to the side, structure down here for the extraction facility, it says it's 10 kilometers away. Uh, it has to have its own radiator, but it does. And solar power cells for energy source, that kind of thing. Instead of having a big mirror like that, why don't you just point the axis of the whole colony towards the sun? Um, well, one of the things that we want, and uh, we'd like to have night and day. And so you got to have a way to turn it off as well as to turn it on. So that's, the mirror gives you that capability. I'm not sure, you know, again, it's, if we all actually went and lived in space, yeah, if we didn't die of radiation poisoning, uh, we'd probably get used to living with 24 hours of daylight at uh, 0.3 G, uh, you know, 10 square meters per person or something like that. Did you say there was going to be a big mirror there to, to send down microwave to, to the Earth? Well, that, that, or you can siphon off of that once it's established. Yeah, we're, we're not sending that from here. Uh, we're building those things, and we're putting those things in geosynchronous orbit mm -hmm. because that's where they can deliver from geosynchronous orbit, they can deliver their microwave energy to Earth without having to worry too much about steering. We can do that. You can be part of that with this direction. Yeah, I suppose you could. We'll put you on the next uh, task force. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so I, I try to give you a sense of this. Let, let me tell you the 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 worst the worst problem I think, which uh, which w was solved. I mean, you know, you get a group of guys sitting around a table with a problem, and after a while, they all agree on something, and only later do you think, geez, what was the matter with us? Uh, what about ionizing radiation? I mean, I, I showed you the mirrors, the, the chevron shield so the light goes in but not the ionizing radiation. What about the rest? What about the two? What are you going to do about that? And because one answer is maybe you could make it have a magnetic field. Not very practical. The energy requirements are large and we don't really know how to do it. So somebody said, well, look, why don't we just pile dirt around this thing? And in effect, that's what was done. This toroid is spinning one RPM. Uh, you might just sometime do a calculation to find out how fast that is when you're out at uh, uh, 900 meters uh, and you're going to go around 2 pi r in 60 seconds. Uh, it's moving. You're moving. Yeah. And, uh, and so the idea is we're going to put this in a tunnel. We're actually going to just take regolith from the moon and pack it up and we're going to pack it up a couple meters thick and so the toroid is going to be going in a tunnel at well, let's see six times nine hundred five forty divided by six so it's it's going something like seventy kilometers per second I mean it's moving uh, no I'm sorry must be more like seventy meters per second I mean, it's 2 pi times 900 divided by 60. 15 times 2 pi. That's about 90. About 90, kilometer, 90 meters per second. Well, what is it? So, uh, 24 and a half meters per second is 55 miles an hour. So this thing is going over 100 miles an hour inside this tunnel. And how far is it from the walls of the tunnel? Well, you don't want it to be very far from the walls of the tunnel because then the tunnel has to be an awful lot bigger. So we're a little vague about how far it is from the walls of the tunnel. One of the things that, I, that this forgets, because I don't think they really understood it back in those days, is the effect of being out in space on the human body. And there was a, an article a few months ago about an astronaut that had a twin who was, who was on Earth. And they measured a whole bunch of things before the guy went up into, I don't remember exactly what he was in, but it was, it was a, for a number of months. Yeah. Space shuttle for a well, year. Space shuttle for a year? Yeah. Space shuttle and, yeah. and at the end of the year, ISS, there, was a, there, was a, yeah. Yeah. there was a pretty substantive difference between him and his twin. Well, what, as I, 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 I addressed that point when I was talking about choosing 1G as the suit of gravity. We chose 1G because we know there are all these effects of deterioration when you're in space. It's, it's the weightlessness of space that causes the deterioration. Uh, 
Um, it's not just being out there, although there's plenty of radiation right. damage possible. But but what, so it, presumably, if you put everybody in one G, it'll just be like on Earth. This may be a second order thing, but did you you know assess the uh, problem of radiation damage on the mirror? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we did, we did this. Yeah, I think the radiation, you know, radiation damage is, is, is probably something you have to think about, but we were thinking more about micrometeorites, of which there's, there's, there's some stuff out there. And we have calculations, you know, we're showing it, the, the, the probability of uh, striking uh, a, of a, a, a small meteorites, you're going to just have to repair. You're going to have things come in that put a hole in things, and you're going to have an air leak. But you can see that the sizes of those things are something where uh, you can repair them before you've had much loss of atmosphere. So you're going to have to live with that. Mm -hmm. Big ones that come in and destroy you utterly, yeah. uh, uh, you s those you can look at what the probability distribution is as we have seen them hitting the moon, uh, which we can now monitor fairly well. And the answer is pretty rare. Uh, like maybe one in a million years, uh, which is another way of saying if you have a million of these things up there, you're going to have one a year that you lose. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a while before we have a million. But anyway, yeah. Charlie, I also, uh, my dad did his main body of work with the effects of ionizing radiation on the dimensional stability of vitreous silicon, which is glass, mm -hmm. like the mirror. Mm -hmm. And there are significant distortions that do take place, and they would have to be taken into consideration. I, I think you, I, I, I absolutely agree. I, uh, anyway, so, so that's, that's kind of the story. Oh, but I, I've always had this vision as I thought about it. Of here I am, I'm going, I don't know, we decided it was about 90 miles an hour, in this tube around there, inside this tunnel, from which perhaps every once in a while some small rock would fall. And so you'd be living in this aluminum tube. Bang, bang, bang. And it'd be like, like having stones in your hubcap, you know? Like the washing machine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, but nobody addressed that problem. <laughs> okay. No, instead, instead we moved into uh, uh, the next stage, which was, well, uh, what's it going to look like? Uh, NASA has the services of artists who will happily depict for you what they're going to look like. And uh, so here's a view, the line of sight. I said, you want a nice line of sight? And so you're looking off in the future. Uh, and you've got the uh, forest at the northwest going up there. And, uh, uh, and you've got people living uh, in a density. Uh, I mean, if this is the density here, uh, then the population must all be downstairs. It looks like ring world. Yeah. Well, it is, of course. It is a ring. And that book goes back, what, 40, 50 years? Uh, well, it looks like one of those new Super Bowls. Oh, you see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 show you, I'll show you a couple of these things. But I just wanted to show you again the idea of decking. So here we are looking at the tube. Um, and the elevator goes as a spoke, goes up to the hub. So now we're looking at the wheel face on. And the people live down here. and. Uh, you can, you can put service stuff down here, and you can have high-density housing. Uh, I think this Mass is... Mass transit? Uh, well, you got to have that, don't you? I mean, it's a mile around, a couple of miles around. <coughs> so you have, you have uh, cars. Well, uh, let's see. A mile walk. Yeah. What was the... What was the is that really water in there? What was the radius of the Taurus itself? I mean, where's the swimming pool? Is that what you're at? Oh, yeah. What was the radius of the Taurus itself? It's 130 meters. I mean, I mean the, the, the donut itself. The donut itself is, uh, radius is, is 895 meters. So the radius, the diameter across is 1 point, not, well, call it 1.8 yeah. kilometers. So you have two so ways to so it's actually, it's actually quite dense. It's a very, very thick donut. Well, uh, the, the, the median line would be at 830 meters. The outer, the outer tire surface is at 895, and the inner is uh, 830 minus 65. It's, it's not, that's not so. No, we're just curious. Not so thick. 
Yeah. So you've got two ways of getting from this side of the torus to the other. One by taking the mass transit all the way around. Right? The second by going up an elevator opposite someone coming the other direction. Right? Okay. You got it. Hmm. That's right. And if you go up the elevator, you get to be weightless for a while. <laughs> All right. Now, somebody said, it looks like a mall. Well, here's some, you know, this is some artist rendition of what it would be like living, coming up the ladder. There you see one of the spokes going up to the roof. Um, I guess this one doesn't show the, uh, the mass transit car. But it certainly looks to me like some of the malls that I've been in. Yes. In the United States of America, I wondered if this was just a cultural artifact of the time when the guy was making the picture. So she goes up the escalator, she loses weight. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, you know, I mean, we can now measure the change in gravity going from this floor to the next floor. You know, we can measure gravity change over about this much distance. Here it would be more noticeable. It's true. Uh, again, uh, Somebody's idea of decking, more of an engineering diagram. But you're going to have to have parts of the tube that are devoted to agriculture. You're going to want them to have, be able to raise different kind of crops. Uh, at the time, we thought, oh, yeah, this is easy to do. But if you've followed anything like with, uh, what was it, the, the one out in Arizona, the bio biosphere. Biosphere. biosphere, all of these things have been such enormous failures. Every time we try to produce a self-sustaining ecology in anything, we have flopped. And so you know, we kind of waved this one aside, but you, you can't wave it aside. Matt Damon did. <laughs> he had some advantages. Yeah. He had a big budget. I mean, getting back to the agriculture, you know, we sort of, what did you, were there provisions for war? Well, we have to bring it. Well, one of the things is when you, in the lunar materials that you bring off, off the moon, you have, uh, uh, you have uh, oxides fairly tightly bound oxides. Nothing we would ever want to use on Earth. Yeah, I mean, but they are oxides that you can electrically uh, separate. So, and they have a lot of oxygen in them. So, so if you're, I mean, the very key idea is that we're going to have a lot of cheap solar power. And with the cheap solar power, we're going to be able to refine the metals. We can get titanium out of moon. Uh, we can get aluminum out of lunar soil. Uh, we can get, and we can get a lot of oxygen. You do have to bring some things from Earth. Um, that'll be expensive, but yeah. Two, two questions or points. One is you can, get, you can get water and stuff from biological materials by using sunlight coming in for the so Well, it has to come from somewhere. Yeah, well, you, but you get the energy from the sunlight. Yes. You've got to have the biological materials themselves. In order to make the water, and I don't know if you make much, but you get you get there. No, but but I mean, they gotta have some hydrogen and some yeah, oxygen. Yeah, you have to have you have to have those materials. Yeah. You have to have water per se. The other thing is, did they go into why you would put these various materials at these various levels? Uh, I don't remember. Okay. You know, I, I I refer you to the book. You have the URL on the handout. That I gave you. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So here again, sort of the difference between an engineering diagram and an artist's view. And now you can see this one has got its mass transit running along the roof uh, beam there. I think that's what that is. And you can see in the distance are densely inhabited regions. But here we are in the uh, agricultural part of the tube, and it's showing it's showing the the same levels down here. Um, I think I think the scale is actually a little bit of a lie, but not much. You know. It, I think this is 130 meters from side to side, and uh, and I was trying to scale it out with people in there, and it didn't seem to me it was wildly off. It just always, always everything moves in the direction of making it look better than it is. <laughs> Can't help that. Essentially, it's a football field. Yeah. Right. Uh, this one has its stuff coming up the curve side, so you get a little more. Uh, so just to remind you, this was how it's going to make its money. <coughs> it's going to uh, beam solar uh, energy converted to microwaves to Earth and put it on the grid, sell it on the grid. You're going to mine the moon. And Go back to that for a second. Sure. Back yeah. when I remember that first being discussed, which was maybe in the 60s or 70s. It was in the 70s. Peter Glazer at uh, Arthur D. Little. They didn't have very good control 
over sending a microwave beam down. And there was all sorts of concerns that you would uh, burn a city to the ground if you, right. if you missed your, your point. Mm -hmm. I suppose today things are a lot better, easier. Sure. It's like gas, you know, like natural gas uh, transmission. It's better than it used to be. And so you only have a Lawrence every few years. <laughs> We've already figured out how to burn down cities in California, so we're all set. No, no. But they talked about putting these, I think, in the ocean, so that if you missed your, uh, or at least some number of miles from shore, yeah. so that if you miss, if the beam somehow missed where it was supposed to be coming down. Yeah, yeah. But don't you, don't you immediately think of corrosion? I mean, every time we put anything in the ocean, it doesn't last more than a year. And in fact, usually it doesn't work at all because salt water eats it. But I thought you should just see some of the artwork that came out of it. Uh, this was in two, I see this is in two pieces, and the left piece needs to be slid up about that much, and then everything matches. But it's showing the idea of sort of taking stuff off the moon, just regular, just scooping it up, compressing it into something that you can send down this launcher, which is an electromagnetic, uh, basically a catapult, just going to throw it into space, which you can imagine doing practically from the moon, because the moon's gravity is sufficiently low. Uh, and then you're going to take this stuff into space, and you're going to build structures in space, big antennas and stuff like that. Uh, here's another mine, moon mining picture. Uh, again, this time they're shooting it off a cliff, but it's still going to go out straight into space is the idea. So these guys had a, had a good time. We had a good time. I mean, it, it was probably, it's about as hard as I've ever worked. I mean, we were doing 20 hour days on this thing. And, uh, uh, but it was probably the most fun I've ever had. As, uh, as, uh, and, and you know, it's a bonding experience. You know, the guys we worked with, we, we stayed in touch afterwards. Um, but, but you know, uh, I, I should mention that there's a couple issues which we worry about. One is, uh, you know, when you put people together in a small environment, uh, you fairly soon will get conflicts. There'll be political, social conflicts. We had them, big time, because, uh, because well, really our problem was with Jerry O'Neill. He was our technical director. He had an absolute vision of what should happen but he was not in charge. We were self-organized. He had an absolute vision that he wanted a big cylinder because he's, he, wanted, he didn't want a cylinder that was 16 miles long, but he wanted the first model to be a cylinder so you could imagine scaling up to that someday. He wanted the big cylinder because, I don't know, maybe he had read Rendezvous with Rama, if you've never read yes. Rendezvous with Rama. Big cylinder and, uh, and and long line of sight. I mean, you could look across and see the other side of your world. But uh, uh, we came into a sizable conflict when we, the participants, said we should make a torus, not a cylinder. A torus would be practical in all the ways I tried to point out. And uh, he was uh, he was really upset. He went to the director of the laboratory, uh, trying to get pressure put on the participants to go with his viewpoint. Uh, the director, I don't know, Hans Mark, I think, I don't know whether he did anything for Jerry or not, but the, the, finally it came down to essentially a vote of the self-organized panels, we're going to have a Taurus. And uh, Jerry was really ticked off about that. And so I always thought of that as kind of just a little flavor of what would happen if we all went to live together in space. Uh, uh, but. There was an, a an afterwards, and I'll just show you some of that. Uh, we ended uh, with a kind of, with uh, a, a public uh, news conference, but we also uh, this is sort of my this is personal stuff. I mean, this is Charlie Hobrow thrills of a lifetime. <laughs> I got mentioned in a footnote in the Ooh. National Geographic. Uh, because in the bicentennial issue, the 1976 issue of National Geographic, a year later, they had an article on first colony in space. And it was, well, it was written by Isaac Asimov, so they had the name. But it was all our stuff. And I 
said to them, hey, you give us a footnote. They gave, they gave us a footnote. And so I was, I was happy. But that footnote produced a, a certain amount of correspondence once my name was out there with my mailing address. I got lots of letters. I got letters from kids. I got letters from different countries. I got letters from cranks. And it was, it was fun. I, you know, I would show you some of those letters, but I put all the stuff in the archive at Colgate. And, uh, and I, have, have not, I, I would have to go to Colgate to get access to it. Uh, so, so that's one thing. Uh, oh, yeah, well, another thing, another memory of the event is Pierre Mion was the artist. And he came out to visit me. I was on my way. This was my summer in uh, 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 near Stanford. And then the, I went on that fall to a sabbatical year at Caltech. And so Pierre Mion came down to Pasadena to uh, take me and my wife out to dinner one night and pump us for details so that he could make nice paintings. And what I remember about that is we went to an Armenian restaurant and drank Retsina. Is that, have I got that right? Oh, oh my God, what a hangover I had. <laughs> <laughs> never again. And, and, uh, and then uh, we had a, uh, and then as I said, there were other consequences. Um, one, uh, I, I think I put on the list at the back, there, there was another summer study. Our summer study was 1975. I think there's one in 77. Uh, that's the one that Jerry O'Neill got set up with himself appointed as Lord High Director so that it would do what he said should be done. And, uh, and if you read his proceedings, you will find no mention of the Stanford Taurus in there. Uh, but he could not overcome the NASA artwork which spread all over the internet. So anybody who's into uh, space uh, at a certain age knows about the Stanford Taurus, uh, and it's still around there. But uh, he then wrote another book himself, The High Frontier, Human Colonies in Space. Uh, one of the uh, uh, strangest people who worked with us is a guy named Tom Heppenheimer. He wrote a book. Uh, Tom Heppenheimer will live forever in my memory because he was a, a postdoctoral associate at Caltech, and he charged a Coca-Cola to the grant. And it took them about seven months to get back through there and take that 85 cents off the grant. <laughs> so, so that so NASA... Uh, so, yeah, no, it was not IRS, it was your funding agency who oh, okay. doesn't want you isn't giving you money to buy Coca-Cola. <laughs> anyway, he, he had some other problems too. Uh, but uh, I went home and I thought to myself, gee, this, this would be really a good framework for teaching physics. And I created a course called The Physics of Living in Space. Uh, I taught it for several years. I taught it at Colgate. I taught it at Cornell a couple of summers. And uh, I had a really good time with that course. Uh, it's a nice way to teach them physics. Um, and then, uh, Having, I had done that. Other people had done things too. And so we had a conference 10 years on, uh, you know, a, a reunion for, for many of us uh, at Hobart and William Smith College, in which people came and talked about using space colonization as a framework for teaching sociology, architecture, history, uh, human, psychology, human relations. And that was great fun. So, so there was all this kind of stuff. Uh, I, I, the, this, would, this would be the place for me to conclude with this picture that I, I'm going to show, pass around to you, because, um, but I only found it this morning. I was going through some old documents and it was too late for me to make a copy and make a slide. And, and I, I, I feel very sad about that. But as I said, we did have a news conference. It was well attended. I think we got some, I think there was some mention on some of the uh, NBC or CBS news uh, Stations. What do you want to do? Oh, you can do that. All right. And uh, uh, so, uh, so we were quoted in the New York Times. Or, I mean, we, there was a little piece in the New York Times about the result of the space study. And I personally was quoted at saying, and it says apparently, because I found this thing, there seems to be an imperative of the human spirit to explore, to expand, to live on a frontier. Perfectly banal, fine statement for somebody who's uh, doing this. 
Uh, New York Times, August 23, 1975. Well, my colleagues back at Colgate saw this. And, uh, and so they, they uh, uh, this, is, this was put together and sent to me by them. And you can see, it shows this large bull standing in a field and he's shitting a big pile. <laughs> but, but I want you also to know, I, I treasure this because I know who drew the picture. It's a guy named Jim Loveless, who was an artist of some note. So I have an original, if unsigned, Jim Loveless artwork here. So, so thank you for... large habitat, which was um, Ames Research Center is at Moffett Field. Mm -hmm. And Moffett Field has a dirigible hangar from the 30s. Mm -hmm. And a dirigible hangar is one very big building. I, mean, I think you could bring an un a fully inflated dirigible inside. And, uh, and one of the things we found interesting was as soon as people lived or worked in such a large uh, space, they started building little structures so they had their little houses so they didn't have to have the ceiling hanging over them so far away. They all immediately went to the world. Yeah, that's what it did. I want to congratulate you. Because, uh, <clears throat> all of us were working before computers, you know, and, and most of us went through the vacuum tube transition to solid state and then shrinking the material and then you know, developing good data processing systems with computers, et cetera, et cetera. If we had those tools 50, 60 years ago, you know, control, like you, you mentioned about controlling the microwave beam and stuff like that, the accuracy would probably, I'm just asking you, a hundred times better. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So we were living in a, you, know, you were working, developing something really in the future, but we didn't have a lot of the media that you needed to do it. I, I have to say, I mean, I have to agree with what you're saying, but I, I am interested that we went out of that that summer, convinced that we could have this done and built by 2000. <laughs> we were recommending, let's go. Let's do it. Um, How much would it cost? Uh, you know, I've forgotten the number, but you know, it would cost billions and billions, maybe a hundred billion, I don't know. You know the same I, thing. I have numbers yeah. in the, in the yeah. study. And yeah. we didn't do it. That was a challenge you didn't solve. Right. <laughs> uh, are there uh, comparisons to structures on Earth that are the same size as this? As this? I mean, like some of the uh, uh, colliders in, you know, these big torus rings come to mind. The well, those, are, yeah, those are underground tunnels. Right. right. So that's not exactly uh, comparable. Um, and they weren't that large in the time. Yeah, but some of, the, some of the tunnels, like it's, you know, they, they built them big enough so you could put another accelerator in the <laughs> How big is the Apple building? <coughs> I don't know. It's very reminiscent of the of the new Apple <laughs> building headquarters, which is this big. It's going to take off some day. Well, I don't know. <laughs> John. But of course, it isn't just size. I mean, you're trying to build something out in space, mm. where every little piece of something that you want to bring there takes a considerable amount of effort, and even if you're bringing things. 
to a Lagrange point or you bring things up from the moon, it's, uh, it's a lot more work. But I think that people assumed that if in 10 years you can go from nothing to a space flight to the moon, that um, you know, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. That was the 1950s technology. Right. Yeah, exactly. That, mm -hmm. that I think people, people assumed that if the U.S. wants to do it, the U.S. could do it. Well, I, I mean, I do think the, the system's reality of you've got to find a commercial reason to do it. You've got to, got to find something that produces a payback or right. it won't happen. Look, look how long our James Webb telescope has taken. I mean, that was supposed to go into orbit in 2007. Right. It's now going into orbit in 2022. And you know it's going to L2? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. But, yeah, well, I don't think that's, I don't, I don't think that's a fair example. Yeah, I think one has to be more hopeful with Elon Musk. Charlie, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do you have any mining engineers in the group? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, we certainly, I, I, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, because you're talking about, in, in fact, yeah. now concentrating a number, yeah. say for titanium. Yeah. And, and if you just go dig up a lot of dirt on the earth, it's very, the, the amount of, of titanium or just about anything, even in clay, is it iron, is, 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 is very small. And so yeah. it, take, it takes a huge amount of energy to actually so, so titanium, you're right. Uh, I, I'm trying iron. to remember the composition of ilmenite, which is the main mineral of the lunar surface. It's, I thought they were, they were talking, I, I don't actually remember. Mm -hmm. I, was, I, mean, I was going to say 3%, but I think... But that's the nature of mining. I mean, most things, with the exception of, I think, coal, when you, when you dig the stuff up, it's a very tiny... Oh, iron ore is fabulous, and you go to the Well, look at gold and silver. Well, you go where there's precious, gold. That's why they call them precious metals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, copper, but you find yeah. veins, but, but the point is, you can't just go to the moon and start digging. Well, that, that's the idea. It, it, the idea is if you, have enough, if you have enough energy, you can. That's, if that is the theory. If the material is profitable enough, lithium mining, for example, in China, that's open bit and that's very low percentage, but it's very valuable material. Now, there's an idea uh, that you should go to the moon and mine helium-3. Helium-3 is a very rare isotope of, of helium, uh, and it's very useful for, um, it's, it's useful for low temperature physics, but uh, there's, there's a world out there saying, oh, helium-3 would make a wonderful fusion fuel. Mm -hmm. And so let's, and helium-3 has been accumulating from solar radiation in the lunar regolith for you know, millions of years. So there are these speculations of how much helium-3 there is. You go and you just scoop up a whole lot of dirt and suck out the helium Well, I don't know how you get the helium-3 out of it. But that's, that would have, people say that would have enough value that it might pay to do it. They think it's trapped there? Yeah. Sure. Why, 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 why should it why should we evaporate? Well because it is it does come in at high energy and gets buried. But, and and I think Harrison Smith, who was I think the only geologist astronaut, uh, has been a big proponent of this idea of getting helium three from the moon. I don't know. But, but there are possibilities like that. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it seemed to me that one problem with this is if you come up with a commercially viable scheme to pay back, that there's going to be a lot cheaper way to do it without all the people involved. What you, if you're fine. going to beam down energy, yeah. just put something up there to collect the solar power and beam it down. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, it just doesn't seem to me you need a space station to do it. Maybe some people, but not a, on a grand yeah. scale. I, I think I think that's that's a, certainly a reasonable argument. But I also think that uh, every time you know we put up the Hubble Space Telescope and it's all wrong, we have to send somebody up to fix it. Uh, our record is not good on putting things up that work perfectly by themselves. But no, I didn't say by my eyes. Limited. Oh, I think you're right. I mean, that's, you start small. Right. I mean, 10,000 people is actually rather small, but 
we, we start. Well, I don't know what we've got in the International Space Station right now. What do we have? Ten? Five? Something, something like that. Very long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you said that the refining was going to be done at some point below this torrent, or, you know, a distance away from the yeah. torrent. But it's at zero gravity, right? Yeah, that would be. Is, is there a reason why you were doing it at zero? I mean, is it going to work better at zero gravity than know. building another little torus or something uh, to have some gravitation on it? I mean, was there a thought? I mean, if you want to do some kind of sedimentary uh, separation, you're going to need... You're going to need something. You're going to need some gravity. Yeah. You know, then we would produce it. Uh, and that would be on a much smaller scale. Yeah. That would be like a centrifuge. Yeah. Do that. Okay. It is a, I mean, it is a wonderful thing to think about. I, I did come away from the summer thinking, boy, I know quite a few people I'd like to send. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> now, is this still on NASA's list of things to do? Um, it never was on NASA's list of things to do. It was, it was our task as a, as a, instructional summer learning about systems design. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry O'Neill certainly has pushed it. There's been discussions in Congress. Um, and uh, uh, so and I know that uh, NASA did fund several serious further studies of this idea of beaming power from space. Mm -hmm. That was done. Peter Glazer was at uh, Little. There's another person whose name I don't recall who had a Another system for doing this, but there were a couple of, uh, you know, these are sky blue research uh, speculative fundings. And you guys go spend some months and do a serious analysis of what could we build, what would it take, what about burning down cities uh, or not, you know, yeah, all, the, all those things. So that, that did go on uh, in, in the years that followed, but by that time I was kind of out of touch. Now, what's the the advantage of being on a steady space versus putting solar panels in the Mojave Desert. So <laughs> one thing is maybe to put high enough to work 24 hours a day, but that means you have to put enough of your bronze points, which means you have to aim it to be more carefully. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, but you know we already lose about half the power, uh, solar power coming in through the atmosphere, right. and uh, and then we lose more when you put it through your solar panels on Earth. So you would get a much higher efficiency of power. You know, would it offset the cost of doing that there? As our technology gets better, maybe the answer will be yes. But probably not right at the moment. But it'd be fun to try. It'd be worth, a, worth putting a small one up and see if you can do it. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll send around a uh, roster you can sign up to go. <laughs> this is all the queer, uh, odd film, but anyway, you know, I was thinking, I was thinking of Gene Roddenberry, the guy who wrote Star Trek. Mm -hmm. You're the real life guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that one. Uh, I, I, I had two sources. I guess I didn't put them on here, but yeah. I, I did want to mention the Moon is a Harsh Mistress, which is a high line story. The, the last of the really good high line stories, I thought. Then he went, then he went all hippie, but. Uh, uh, in the moon is a harsh mistress. You have uh, you have the moon as a penal colony, and, and people are mining it there. And now it's grown and grown and grown. It's kind of like Australia's story. It's now gotten to a point where they're resting, but they feel Earth is not treating them right. Uh, they discover that uh, uh, they can actually uh, threaten Earth with uh, just throwing rocks which will come down with about the same amount of energy as a small nuclear weapon. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, under the leadership of an absolutely fictitious computer-generated persona, uh, they revolt against the Earth and become an independent uh, place. So we can relive 1776, <laughs> but on the moon. Anyway, I like that story a lot. And, uh, so I, I always thought the two science fiction books that went with our study were Arthur Clarke's Rendezvous with Rama, where it's a large cylindrical spaceship that arrives in our solar system from somewhere. They go and they look at it. Uh, they don't find anything. I can't remember. I mean, they don't find it. it comes alive. There are all kinds of things that turn on. The system start to work. And then it goes around the sun and passes on out, and everything turns off again. 
end of the story. It's kind of an Arthur Clarke story. But, uh, but that one and uh, Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Recommended you.